Right, welcome everybody to the uh, February meeting of the Bornington Peninsula Astronomical Society. And uh, a few things uh, to actually show you up, uh, up here on uh, the screen, if you can see that uh, okay. First of all, we're going to have a, uh, another moon landing this Friday at uh, just before 10 o'clock in the morning. This is a um, commercial landing, so the first one by a private company landing on the moon and um, first time America's gone back to the moon and uh, hopefully lands successfully at that time. So this very much uh, is um, uh, the, uh, the picture here of the uh, Odysseus craft on, on the way to the moon. They actually snapped that uh, picture on the way. And um, uh, it uh, is due to get there within a, about a day or so. And uh, when it does, it's uh, going to uh, test a proof of concept. Now, that particular lander is going to land, but it's not going to come back. So it's very much a one-way trip. And uh, it'll do uh, leave a few science uh, experiments on the moon and also test uh, the systems for the future. Because what they're planning on doing is using this for a lot of heavy lifting to the moon. Um, it was launched on a SpaceX uh, craft, I think, and um, uh, this is all about building a moon base on the moon. So uh, uh, they're putting it over to the uh, private sector to actually uh, try and uh, have that uh, occur. So uh, that will occur on uh, Friday. Then if we uh, go across to the right-hand side there, tonight we've got something happening. Um, the European Space Agency's um, uh, European uh, Remote Sensing Satellite Number 2 is going to be uh, re-entering. Uh, it's a two-ton lump of uh, metal that's been uh, basically doing remote monitoring of uh, the Earth's environment, so sea, land uh, and air as well. Uh, it's actually coming over us at about uh, quarter past eight uh, tonight, but it'll be too bright to actually see it as it uh, passes over. And you see there's, there's the track there going not, not far from uh, where we are uh, tonight. Um, they have actually imaged it up uh, in orbit still, so they know it's coming down. It's run out of fuel, but um, the last few uh, remnants of fuel, they used it to try and pull it down, so it will come down, otherwise it would have stayed up there for another couple of centuries. So unlike the Chinese craft that tend uh, to let their uh, fuel completely deplete and then it comes down at random, uh, at least the European Space Agency had the, uh, the common sense to leave enough fuel there to have a, a, a guided uh, a drop uh, on, the, uh, on the surface. Now you'll see the, uh, some of the possible paths and uh, one of them comes right over Victoria. They're still not sure precisely when it's going to come down. So uh, it's thought to be about 3.30 tomorrow morning, so early morning, plus or minus four hours. So it might be 11.30 or it might be 7.30. And uh, where it lands can be pretty much anywhere on the Earth's surface, given that uh, it goes around the Earth every uh, just under 90 minutes, uh, 89 minutes in that particular case. Um, where those images came from, there's a Sydney company called HEO that uh, you can put a request into it to image any object in the solar system or, or around the Earth and you put in a request to actually image another satellite and what it does is it uh, works out what cameras are actually in orbit that are free and available to uh, be able to image it. So they, they turn cameras on another satellite onto it and that uh, those couple of images there are the, uh, the spacecraft uh, coming down. Now they said you'll definitely be able to see it if it does uh, come, come down uh, and uh, it'll be very, very bright and uh, in, in this particular instance it would occur uh, no, it, pr probably to the east of us, slightly to the east in the sky, but we'd have no trouble uh, spotting it. Now down uh, bottom left here, um, those of you who were in the society in 2019, uh, just before the pandemic uh, uh, raised its head, uh, might recognise this person. Uh, Stephen Slater there is uh, one of the producers of the Apollo 11 movie and uh, he came to Victoria in 2019 and was going to present uh, the Apollo 11 uh, movie uh, down here uh, in uh, Mornington before it was actually released uh, globally. Uh, unfortunately, the only place uh, that could play it because it was in a special cinematic format um, was the, uh, the Mornington Cinema. And unfortunately, they required several weeks' notice to be able to slot it in, so they weren't able to actually fit him in. So we had to turn him away from coming down here, 
uh, to, uh, to screen it and uh, we managed to arrange for him to screen it at a cinema up in Ballarat. So the Ballarat Astronomical Society uh, sort of jumped on board and several of our members actually went up there to, uh, to see the screening at the time. Now he's back in Australia, he's uh, been going through the NASA archives once again uh, because that movie Apollo 11 uh, showed a lot of um, uh, never before aired uh, footage so he'd been going back through a lot of the archival footage that had never been uh, released in, uh, in the archives. And he's been doing it for some of the other Apollo missions as well. And he's coming down to uh, Victoria um, sometime in the next four or five weeks and will be coming down here to, um, uh, to give a presentation uh, about uh, um, the latest findings that, that he's had. And uh, he's giving a talk up at Mount Stromlo on Friday and it'll be the same talk that uh, is given up at uh, Mount Stromlo and showing the same footage that uh, has never been seen before of those. So when we find out some more details of precisely when he's uh, uh, coming down, um, we'll, uh, we'll post it out on uh, eScorpius in the, uh, the email. This particular time, uh, it won't be uh, a cinematic format only. Uh, it will be a format that can play on a PC and through a data projector uh, because that was one of the requirements that Mount Stromlo had as well. They, they couldn't also uh, play anything in uh, the cinematic format. Then over here on the right hand side, um, if you remember going back uh, a couple of years, uh, there was this uh, spacecraft called the DART spacecraft that they flew into the one of the moons of an asteroid to try and um, uh, impact it to see if they would affect the orbit. And if you remember, the name of the asteroid was Didymos and it had a little moon Dimorphos. And they, uh, they flew the DART spacecraft at several kilometres per second into it to uh, head on so as to try and um, knock, it, uh, knock it slightly so that uh, if for some reason in the future an asteroid were coming towards Earth and they were able to detect it early enough, they could potentially um, build a similar craft or crafts to try and give it a nudge out of the way. And the theory was after the impact, um, it would change its orbit just, just slightly. So it's pretty much like flying a, um, a spacecraft into Mount Dandenong and hoping that Mount Dandenong moves a couple of centimetres right, from, from doing it. Now, what they are actually asking for, this is uh, professional astronomers are now called on the amateur astronomers in Australia uh, to monitor this, um, uh, uh, this asteroid and its moon. Uh, in May, July and August this year and uh, do occultation timing of it before the uh, European Space Agency's HERA spacecraft uh, gets to it. So the European Space Agency has sent another spacecraft uh, to that asteroid uh, with the hope of uh, being able to um, determine pretty accurately what the uh, impact uh, has actually been on it. So they're actually asking amateurs to uh, provide uh, timing measurements, very, very good timing measurements of occultations, which are where the asteroid passes in front of a background star, the star disappears. And if you actually time precisely when it disappears and when it reappears again, you can position the, uh, that asteroid in its orbit really, really accurately. And amateur astronomers can do that even with a small uh, telescope. Uh, in this particular case, the occultations are like magnitude 5. Uh, the, I think the worst one is about magnitude 10 or 11 stars. So even a 4-inch telescope would be able to do it. The hard part is actually uh, being able to, um, uh, to time it with uh, hopefully GPS uh, accuracy. <coughs> but when I find out a bit more about that, uh, I'll um, pass it around the society. Right, so tonight, welcome uh, everybody. And we have quite a, quite a lot of uh, new members uh, joined since we're here, and I'll read out their names now. There's uh, Daz and uh, River Patterson, Marielle Souser and their uh, family, Taryn and Ron Main, Cheryl Brown and family, Craig and Lucy Johnson, Amy Quirk, Paul Van Leeuwen, Robert King, Nathan Johnson, Ingrid Pinkerton, Sylvia Papp, and James Martinus and family. Any of those here tonight? Ah, no, 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 none here tonight, uh, so um, uh, if, if they were, we would uh, welcome you and uh, point you to someone that, uh, that you can have a chat to uh, afterwards to try and uh, make you feel uh, at home. Right, so as usual, we'll go through the events uh, past and uh, coming month. 
Uh, Chris will do uh, Astromofo. Uh, Greg Walton standing in for Guido, who's overseas at the moment uh, for uh, Sky for the Month. So Guido's put together some slides, and uh, Greg has kindly dusted off his uh, laptop and uh, will attempt to talk to, uh, to Guido's uh, slides. Cosmic Corner's put off because uh, Eden was, uh, wasn't able to uh, come tonight. Uh, and then we'll look into uh, Uranus and uh, give a talk by these uh, two uh, uh, clever scientists uh, all, all about uh, why NASA and the European Space Agency are so keen to go back to, uh, to Uranus, uh, which is uh, way out in the, uh, the outer solar system. Then we'll look at where is the edge of the universe and how loud was the actual Big Bang itself. Before we close uh, at the end with the usual uh, musical thing, uh, and this is the uh, Baby Comeback mission, from, which is one of the um, uh, electron launches of, uh, uh, of the uh, New Zealand company, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty impressive uh, video. Right, so recent events uh, shown in the background there, picture by Phil, uh, is um, the, uh, the recent trivia night uh, last uh, weekend that was uh, here at the Briars. Uh, but before we get down to there, 19th of January, we had the public night up here. Manfred gave a talk and uh, had mostly uh, cloud cover. And as you can see, there's a lot of cloud cover when uh, we come down to uh, looking at the, uh, the, the, uh, the trivia night as well. Uh, there was a working bee uh, the next day and Greg trained up for some members uh, in the observatory with that. Uh, committee had uh, its meeting on, uh, on Zoom a couple of days later and uh, a lot of that was around uh, Harry Potter and, uh, you know, the, uh, the little light walk that uh, was down the bottom. I think uh, that's now been scuppered or, or moved elsewhere uh, since that time. Um, we were talking about uh, guardrails as well, and uh, they, they will appear on the lower slab uh, in the, uh, the near future, I would think. Uh, this was more to uh, stop people accidentally walking off uh, the slab where the level is, uh, is, is different between the, the ground on the one side of the concrete and, uh, and the other. Uh, there was also a lot of discussion about having uh, um, a bit of a library lounge and chairs over there uh, in the corner for people to, uh, to sit down and rest their weary legs and, uh, and read something. And uh, we're, we're uh, looking into that one at the moment. Uh, and we looked at the general project list of things that needed to be done, uh, which, uh, which Chris is kindly uh, compiling. Then that Saturday, the Cosmology Discovery Group met, uh, had a really good turnout by the looks of it. Over 20 people uh, turned up and uh, they had talks by Eden, Brian and, uh, and Doug that Saturday. Public night in February was given by Trevor, who was then back from his uh, cruising around uh, the world. Uh, we had a good turnout, 95 public, basically everyone who booked turned up, which, uh, is, usually unu which, which is unusual. Um, and there was absolutely no cloud whatsoever, so that was a great night uh, that they all had, uh, fortunately. Um, 17th of February, the Astrophotography Group had its uh, inaugural meeting here at the Briars on the Saturday, and uh, uh, they uh, heard uh, Russell Smith give a, a talk about that, and uh, maybe Chris will say something uh, about that a little bit later. Uh, and that evening, the trivia night, uh, had uh, Dave Rolfe uh, uh, MCing it. Uh, I wasn't able to come that night, uh, but uh, it was a really good turnout. 89 uh, were there. Fortunately, the conditions were warm. Otherwise, if uh, it had to have been inside, if it was raining, um, uh, you know, 89 might have been uh, a li little bit cosier. And as you can see, about 70% uh, cloud that evening. So it uh, wasn't perfect uh, conditions, but uh, nevertheless, I think everyone had a good time. Coming up in the next month, uh, things are starting to move. We've got a working bee this weekend at uh, the Briars. Then on the Sunday, we've got the Bentley Street Festival where the, um, the Society's big black uh, marquee will be uh, used uh, for the first time. Last year, they, their crowd count was about 6,000 people uh, turned up to that. And it's it was probably more than that, actually, in, uh, in retrospect. We're anticipating the same, so we have a spot on uh, Centre Road in uh, Bentley. Any uh, members wish to come on by and say hello? Um, we'll have telescopes there pointing at the moon and the sun and that sort of thing. Uh, we've got the Bryas Access Road, uh, which uh, you would have driven across as, uh, as you came in tonight. That uh, is due to be closed uh, over uh, that period from the 26th to the 1st of March, and uh, that was considered to be too high a risk to have the public night on the 1st of March 
Uh, theoretically, it may have been open, but uh, no one was willing to actually give a guarantee that it would be open, so we called the public night off. So there is no public night up here on the 1st of March, which is the very first time ever in the history of the society we've had to call off a, a public night. 6th of March, we got Strathaird Primary, which is uh, uh, Nerida's Girls' School. Um, they'll be next door at the camp, as it turns out, and uh, we'll put on a, uh, a night for them. Uh, 9th of March, we've got a 60th birthday party. Again, they've booked out the camp next door, and uh, we'll give them a, a night here that uh, Saturday. Then another big event, uh, the Somerville Family Fun Day, which is, will be down at Somerville on the 11th of March, which is Labor Day, so it's a public holiday, it's a Monday. And that's anticipating uh, about 19,000 people turning up. And again, we've got um, the, uh, uh, the Society's big black uh, marquee uh, set up and uh, they've positioned us in a good spot for uh, placing uh, our telescopes so fa facing north. Because this is a daytime event, it's not a nighttime event. 19th of March, we've got Parkdale Secondary uh, again. So we do those at least once a year and uh, there'll, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, students turning up for that one. It ranges between about 100 and 200, depending on how many turn up on the night. Next monthly meeting is here on the 20th of March, and a few days later we've got the Telescope Learning Day, and there's two of those Telescope Learning Days every year now, and this is the first one of the year, and at the moment we've got plenty of uh, seats available if uh, any members or the public uh, wishes to uh, book in for those ones. Okay, welcome to um, Astromofo number 12, uh, Dark Nebulas. Uh, so um, I'm sure you're all aware by now, this is the monthly challenge that we have for our members where we select an object uh, or a type of object of interest and um, members are charged with uh, going out and gathering photos of it. And uh, Dark Nebulas was the last one that we did. Um, and uh, so what is a Dark Nebula? Basically a Dark Nebula is a collection of dust and gas in space that isn't reflecting or emitting any light. Um, so they're just clouds of dust and gas, dark, we can't see through them, we can't really see into them, and they're usually blocking out the stars behind them and the, emission, the light emissions of the nebulas that are behind them, and that's how we get them to show up. Um, they're usually regions of star formation, so there is active star formation going on inside them, and this is one of the things that the uh, James Webb Space Telescope is hoping to be able to see, and that is to look into dark nebulas like the Horsehead, which I think is one of its image runs which is soon coming up. So be able to have a bit of a look inside the Horsehead and just see what sort of star formation is going on in there. Um, the Chandra X-ray Observatory has actually been able to look into the uh, Horsehead and it's actually seen protoplanetary disks and things like that forming around there. And, you know, there's Probably, I think they, uh, there was something like hundreds of pl protoplanetary disks forming inside the Horsehead Nebula. So you've got a lot of planetary and star formation going on in there. Um, now, this is probably one of the most recognisable dark nebulas that we have in the sky. It's the Horsehead, and um, which uh, probably you know right there. Um, this one's not going to win any races because it's facing the wrong way. Uh, the, that should be flipped the other way around, but. Um, taken by David Rolfe, and it's all designated B33 or LDN 1730. And a lot of uh, B33 is the Barnard catalogue, and which has a lot of dark nebulas uh, within it. The other one that we've got in this photo is the Flame Nebula, right around there. Um, and the dark bits are not part of the nebula that aren't emitting light. They're actually dark dust and dark nebula, which is blocking the light from the nebula behind it. So we've got that one there to start off with from Dave Rolf. Uh, okay, members who completed this challenge were Kelly Clithero, Nick Axaris, Nerida Lancake, Chris Black, Chris Costa Canellis, David Rolf, and Greg Walton. Uh, and this photo here is by uh, Nick Axaris. It's a cometary globule, CG4, and it's located around about 1300 light years away from us in the constellation of Pupus. So these, these cometary globules, these are actually really faint objects and it's, uh, it's actually quite a, quite a task to be able to image them. And this one here took about um, 
14 hours of acquisition by Nick to image this object and uh, using 15 minute subframes. So keeping the camera open for 15 minutes, collecting light, and he did that for 14 hours uh, to stack and get this image. So uh, this is actually located in Pupus, which is the back of Carina, the Carina constellation. Um, and it's also known as the hand of God. It looks like a hand reaching out to grab that little galaxy up there. That galaxy is millions of light years away. The hand of God or the, the CG4 is much closer. Um, the, uh, it also looks like a bit of a sandworm from June. We've got the June movie coming up, so a lot of people think uh, it may look like one of those. Um, now, the size of this, the head of it, the head of the comet is, cometary globule is around about one and a half light years across. The tail is about eight light years long. And there's a few of these in this, this region, and they're actually pointing away from, orientated, pointing away, I think, from the Vela supernova remnant. So it's thought that perhaps the supernova somehow disturbed that gas and made these point in the same direction. Um, now, the other thing that I see when I look at this is not a June worm, but there we go. Millennium Falcon. Okay, so where is this located? Uh, probably hasn't come up too well, but oops, let's go back. We've got uh, the Southern Cross right here with the pointers. We've got the Carina constellation here and the Pupus constellation right there. Vela is right there. And that's where the, this cometary globule is in the sky. So it's in the southern sky, looking that direction. But like I said, it's incredibly faint, incredibly difficult to image. So not really something you would see with the telescope. The horse head, oh, I think we borderline may have imagined we saw a view of it at the star party earlier, or late last year. But um, yeah, Greg's got better eyes than me. I wasn't able to see, not even with... In averted vision or imaginary vision, neither or I was, couldn't see it, but my eyes weren't good enough. Um, okay, we'll stay around Orion now. Um, so we've, these are a couple of images by Greg, imaged here at the Briars, uh, still in the Orion constellation, um, using the eight-inch ref reflector down at the uh, observatory. And we've got again the horse head and the flame. Uh, we also have here M78, um, the reflection nebula in Orion as well. And you can see through there the dark nebula cutting, uh, cutting across through that. And these are also from the observatory, but using the Mead, 350 millimeter Mead. So much more zoomed in views, make, you know, bringing out more detail and a bigger view of the nebulas. Again, we've got oops, the flame again, over here, the horse head and M78. So just, you know, a much larger view of the nebulas using the larger telescope. Uh, these are a couple that I managed to image. I mean, you can't really give up an opportunity to shoot the horse head when you have to, so I got that of that. And also the Boogeyman Nebula. So the Boogeyman Nebula also in Orion. And the Boogeyman Nebula, is, again, is a... Oh, I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, which is that one there. That's a section of Barnard's Loop in Orion, and that is actually on the opposite side of Barnard's Loop to where M78 is. So you've got the boogeyman on one side and M78 would be sitting up around about there, um, just opposite it. Um, okay, that one, these ones here again with the, oh, the two different telescopes on this as well. The boogeyman with, was with my 80 mil refractor and the horse head and flame was with the 200 millimeter Newtonian. Uh, okay, so we've got Orion here and where these are, we've got uh, Alnitak, which is where the Horsehead and the Flame Nebula are. Uh, and then we've got M78 just in there and the Boogeyman Nebula just out there. And that's Barnard's Loop is sort of cutting around that sort of area there. Uh, now we're looking south towards the south skies. These are another couple of images that I got. Um, the one on the left is the Chameleon Molecular Cloud. And now these two... Dark nebulas are fairly close to us, 500 to 700 light years away, and they're the two nearest star forming regions to us. But they're forming sort of lower mass stars, low to medium mass stars within them. Um, so the chame chameleon molecular cloud, also called Saint Vist 135, or a part of it, a section of it, which is that section there. 
the Sankvist 135. And Sankvist was, I think, a Swiss astronomer around the 1930s who uh, observed a lot of um, these dark nebulas. And so a lot of these dark nebulas in the southern hemisphere have Sankvist uh, designations. Uh, that one there is about 255 minutes of exposure uh, using my refractor and a light pollution filter. And uh, the other one is called the dark doodad. Um, and that is it cutting through there. And we've got a uh, globular cluster in that photo as well, which is uh, NGC 4372. Just two different filters on these. And the reason I use the filters is just to try and cut out a lot of the light pollution. Uh, having to image these, you need longer exposures, but you're also getting a lot of sky glow and light pollution coming in. The filters just help to cut that out. Uh, and now I've got a couple of Vita Carina nebulas, one by Kelly Clitheroe and one by Nera de Lancake. And Vita Carina actually has a um, indigenous story behind it, and a um, uh, it, it it's by the Kologularik. Well, uh, hang on, uh, the Burong people of northwestern Victoria. They call uh, they call Vita Carina Gularik Wa, the Raven's wife. Um, the Raven is Canopus. Um, whose name is Wa. Kologularik is wife. Um, so they call it Ra the, Raven's, the Raven's wife. But And the story goes, I don't think they were actually able to see the Carina Nebula itself or the dark lanes through the Carina Nebula. But in the 1840s um, is when Eda Carina had its outburst. And for a period there, it was the second brightest or the brightest star in the southern sky. And uh, there are stories in indigenous culture where they actually recognize this event and recognize the outburst of Karina as uh, the, the, um, the crow's wife, the raven's wife. Uh, so that's, that's the story uh, in there. So the, the uh, Eda Karina and Canopus, the crow and uh, his, his wife flying together in the southern skies, which is a beautiful story and uh, what we've got so I'll just point out a couple of things here we've got these little dark patches cutting through Carina giving it its distinct shape through the Eta Carina nebula uh, and you can see pretty distinctly we've got that dark patch there and here we have plenty of stars here we have no stars so the dark nebula really blocking out the light from the stars and the nebula behind it uh, so Kelly Clitheroe is the image on the left, uh, and the other one is by Nira de Lancake using Impasse's Seastar S50. If uh, you're not aware, we recently purchased a, a Seastar, Seastar S50, a motorized little uh, uh, deep sky camera, which we use for our outreach events uh, where we can attach it to a tablet and people can come and have a look at images of deep sky objects. Uh, it's good for... Um, people who perhaps aren't able to look through a telescope for one reason or another. So we have uh, this new tool now to be able to help them out to see, uh, see images of the, the deep sky images. It also does some pretty good solar uh, photography as well, which I'm sure we'll get a workout in the upcoming festivals. Uh, okay, here we have uh, an image by Chris Black, which is the Colsac Nebula, um, pretty much right in Crux, the Southern Cross. Uh, it's actually visible to the naked eye. If you're at a dark site, you can actually see the glow of the Milky Way behind it, and you can see the, the patch there, which is the Colsac Nebula. Um, so this is using uh, his uh, 6D, his Canon, uh, with a 50mm lens. So it's actually a, a fairly wide field of view, and uh, six-minute subframes, so fairly long exposures. Um, uh, so yeah, it is visible to the naked eye under the right conditions um, and you can pretty much see it, no equipment, you go out, you look up, Southern Cross, as long as there's no moon in the sky ruining at all, you're able to get a pretty good view of it. Um, now, normally I'd put a Stellarium view to show you where all the other objects were, but why would I do that when I've got this great image by Chris Black? So this is the Colsac Nebula there. We've got the pointers Alpha and Beta Centauri there and Crux right there, that's the Colsac there. Eta Carina is right up there. Uh, the dark doodad is in there somewhere. Actually, it's not showing up too well on the screen, but the dark doodad nebula is, I think it's right there, actually. And the other one, the um, um, molecular cloud, the chameleon molecular cloud, is actually not in this field of view, but it would be sitting just around about there. So pretty close to the south celestial pole. It's only about 15 degrees from the south celestial pole. Uh, 
Okay, that was all the photos for this one. The next challenge is artificial satellites. Uh, so we want to try and image the ISS, the Tiangong Space Station, Starlink satellites, weather satellites, spy satellites, whatever we can get. Hubble Space Telescope will be pretty difficult because it's very, very low on the northern horizon. And uh, there's only, I think, you know, very early in the morning I saw that you may get a couple of chances to see it. Um, and then other satellites and debris. And I only want, I'm not going to take spam of people just sending me lines of light through their photos. I want you to identify what you've actually imaged. So what satellite is it? And you can use apps like um, Heavens Above or other apps. Uh, Stellarium also identifies satellites. So tell me what you've actually imaged. Or if you haven't been able to figure out what you've imaged is the other one. So if there's something that you've looked up, you've seen it, it's not in any catalogue, but it's still there, uh, send that one in and we'll send it out to the Brains Trust and see if we can figure out what it is. We may have a UFO on our hands. Um, okay, so that is the next challenge. And you can use anything. You can use a phone, a camera, a telescope, whatever you want. And try, actually, you can try and get these satellites going through particular constellations or particular objects if you want to... If there's a, you can actually see on the app where a satellite is scheduled to pass and you could probably line it up. It'd be great if someone could actually get a photo of the ISS using a telescope or a transit or something like that. I know Guido got one last year or the year before. He actually imaged the ISS next to the moon. So if someone could um, get something like that, that would be great. Or the Tian Gong, of course. Uh, now, also, MPAS is doing a 2025 calendar. So um, images, that, uh, captures, uh, images that members have captured this year, we're going to collate them all and put out a calendar for 2025. Um, so we want a range of different types of photos, wide field, deep sky, deep space, different types of objects, the moon in close up or sunrise, sunsets, moonrise, moonsets, anything of interest. Um, or uh, different atmospheric phenomena and also we want images from uh, members at different stages of their ability. So using very, very basic equipment to using maybe even the more advanced type of equipment. So we just want a range of images that we can put together by uh, members and uh, put out a calendar for everyone for next year. So we'll probably try and collate everything by around about October so that we can get it all together and publish it and have it available for sale uh, before the end of the year. Uh, now, there, I didn't have anything really to say about the uh, workshop we had, but we did have a workshop here last week, uh, and Russell Smith was good enough to go through planetary imaging and processing uh, for us. He gave us a lot of good tips about how to capture and then what to do with your data once you've captured it in order to get some nice uh, uh, Jupiter or Moon images or Saturn images and that sort of thing. So that was actually quite good. Um, and there was also a... He did put most of... I did do an article in East Scorpius a little while ago, which I pointed to in the posts. So if anyone is interested in that, come and see me and I'll let you know which East Scorpius edition it was. And uh, Russell was going to put together a little package for us to be able to post as well about what he, um, what he told us on the day. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Nope. Excellent. So this just shows where we are and, and the other planets. So you can s the interesting thing here is if you go out in the morning sky and look for Venus around 5 o'clock, you'll see Mercury is below Venus. That, that moved and then as that moved around, Mars went to the other side of Venus. Uh, as as time went on. It's just
just zooming out just to show you where the other planets are in relationship to us and um, and the and the sun. So um, Saturn is around the around the back of the sun now, along with um, Mercury. So we can pretty much only see uh, Jupiter and um, Uranus. The sun setting with with Venus and and um, Mars just ahead of it, and you can see Saturn and, and Mercury are very close to the Sun, so we can't see them. So these are basically the only planets we can see. No, it's behind the Sun. We can't see it. We, it will have to be another couple of months. Okay, so what we've got here, oh, so Saturn um, is, has gone behind um, the Sun and then um, Neptune. Oh, these are the dates where it will go behind the Sun. So you can see we, we're losing a few of them behind the Sun. And over here, uh, Jupiter is setting at um, 10.30 next month. So we're losing, losing Jupiter. And um, Uranus is setting around 11 o'clock, so we're losing that one too. It's getting less and less each day. And uh, so this is later on in the night. So this is the sort of going to the morning sky. So we have a lot of uh, messier objects coming up in the morning sky for people who like to view them rather than wait till winter to see them. So that's just a, another slide. So the Southern Cross here and um, Canopus and Cirrus is the whole sky. So that's how our sky looks at the moment. You'll notice that um, um, the Southern Cross is coming up just in the southeast here. So that's it coming up, coming up. That's how it would look because normally the tree line's here somewhere. We don't see that part. So that's just a stationary slide. This is just the constellations to the to the south. What constellations? So Corvus is coming up. Corvus the crow. So if you're out and you can see that right in the middle of that that constellation, there's a nice little planetary nebula. So worth having a look at that one. It's sort of half circle and a few stars through it. So most of them you don't see stars, so it's near it. So it's quite interesting. Yep, so this is the sky turning uh, throughout the night. So we started off with the Southern Cross down here, so the whole sky is turning around. The, and um, you see there's some comets coming up in the sky, in the morning sky. And you can see um, Mars is above... Venus. So, yep, Venus is the morning object that's got up here. And Mars, is, uh, Mars and uh, Venus are going to be very close together on these dates. Well, just the next few days. They're very close. If you go out in the morning, um, it, they should be only one degree apart, which is about twice the diameter of the moon. We'll probably get cloudy mornings from the next few days and we won't get to see it. So, so Mercury is in superior conjunction, meaning it's it's gone behind uh, the sun, isn't it? And then these are the times of the full moon and the uh, new moon next month. So around the tenth, about two weeks' time, or three weeks' time, we'll have dark skies again. You got a list, got some comets in the sky. going into the sun coming up. So oh, so this is how the planets look relative to their size. Of course Jupiter's the, the biggest thing there, but pretty much the only thing we can see at the moment. 
all the others had gone round behind the sun. Comets, we've got a few comets. So I think these ones are in the evening sky. Um, so I was thinking of actually going out and trying to image some of these because some of them are in, in, in a spot that's quite easy to get to. I noticed, and then there was a few more. So if you, um, there's a website called uh, Southern Comets. So that's just Google Southern Comets, and it'll tell you where to find these. I find that's a very good um, website. And we've got a, a meteor shower peaking on the 14th of next month. Um, but very only six per hour. It's um, and best to view in the early morning. And and why we view in the morning is because um, in the evening, because the way we're travelling forward, we're actually behind the Earth. So as as when we go around to the morning, the Earth turns and then the meteor starts smashing into us head on. So that's why it's always best in the in the morning. Yeah, so this is just marking where it is. This one's it, it's not far from um, the Southern Cross. So it's quite, um, quite an easy one to find. So, and uh, yeah, so all this came from Stellarium, um, NASA Sky, to Solar System, and um, the magazine that we sell, the Astronomy 2024. So I'm pretty much done. So tonight's uh, feature is all about uh, Uranus and uh, the, uh, the two scientists shown at the top there, Dr. Athena Kuskensis from uh, Paris Observatory and uh, Dr. Naomi Rowe Gurney from the Goddard Space Flight uh, Centre will uh, basically give uh, a bit of a, a talk about uh, Uranus and why uh, they're getting excited about it. This is uh, courtesy of the Royal Society of uh, Chemistry and it'll be hosted by um, a a, a cosmochemist, a geochemist, uh, Dr. Natalie uh, Starkey as well. Now this goes for about uh, 55 minutes and uh, while it does so feel free to get up and uh, wander around and have a, a cup of coffee and I'll also pass around the new Australian dollar coin if you haven't seen it, the one that uh, is uh, Australia in space, so that's the astronomy themed uh, one dollar coin that uh, is in circulation now you may wish to have a look at. I'm Natalie Starkey, Chemistry World Science Media Producer, and I'm here for the next hour to fly us to the edge of the solar system and find out more from our scientific experts about the science of the ice giant Uranus. Uranus and Neptune sit alone in what we might call the frozen frontier, being the only major class of planet yet to have a dedicated mission of exploration. So we're looking at why there are space agency plans to launch a mission to visit this icy planet that boasts rings and moons, a complex atmosphere, as well as spinning on its side, giving it the most extreme seasons in the solar system. Throughout this hour, you'll meet two scientists who are excited about a future mission to Uranus, and we'll hear more from them on what we already know about the planet and what we can discover if we make it out there in the future. Following the webinar, you might want to take a look at a recent Chemistry World feature written by Anthony King that actually inspired this session. Mission to Uranus looks at the reasons why we're thinking of revisiting the ice giant Uranus, which of course we'll be discussing here today. So we'll share the link for that in the chat for you to bookmark for later. I will welcome now our guests who I will invite to turn on their cameras. I'll just give them a few seconds to find the buttons for that. There so we have Naomi Rogerny and Athena Kustinis. Welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us today. Um, Athena is Director of Research with the French Centre for Scientific Research at the Paris Observatory. She specialises in astrophysics and planetology. She contributes to the development of space missions and, and analyses the acquired data to investigate the atmospheres and surfaces of planets, satellites and exoplanets. Some examples of these have been the NASA ESA Cassini-Huygens mission and the upcoming JUICE and Aerial ESA missions. Now, Naomi is a James Webb Space Telescope Guaranteed Time Observer, postdoctoral research associate at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. She's a solar system ambassador for the JWST and obtained her PhD in 2021 from the University of Leicester in the UK. 
Their thesis used archive data from the Spitzer Space Telescope to study the thermal structure and composition of the middle atmospheres of the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. And we were told today that Naomi actually received a really exciting prize recently. It was, it was announced last night, wasn't it, Naomi? Would you want to tell us a tiny bit about that quickly? Yeah, it was announced at like 8 p.m. last night. Um, I was the recipient of the uh, DPS NSBP uh, Speaker Award um, for this year. That's brilliant. So congratulations. I'm glad that I'm glad that we've got you here today. That's brilliant. So we'll be hearing um, more from both our speakers um, in a minute. Uh, but if you have any questions already for either of them, then please do start sending those in um, and we can you know, collate those for later. Um, it's nice to have a lot of questions coming in for our speakers. Right now we're going to start um, with Naomi first of all. So Naomi, if you'd like to turn on your camera and um, find the right buttons to share your screen. Um, so that we can bring your presentation up. Brilliant, I can see that now. So I'm gonna turn off um, my camera for a minute and I'll hand over to you. Great, okay. So um, today I'm gonna be talking to you about um, seeing Uranus from space. Let's get all those Uranus jokes out of the, out of the way first. Um, and uh, so that what that means is that I'm gonna be talking to you about using um, space telescopes specifically to look at Uranus. So the space telescopes that um, we use that are closer to Earth and not the ones that are going there, um, hopefully in the future. Um, so Natalie already said a little bit about me. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit more uh, about how I got to where I am. So um, I did a four year integrated masters in physics with astrophysics at the University of Leicester. Um, I graduated in 2012 and then took a break for five years, um, ended up as a, a, a physics teacher. And then I ended up back in Leicester for my PhD that I finished in September 2021. And my thesis was looking at the chemical and temperature, temperature structure of the atmospheres of the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, uh, with mid-infrared spectroscopy. And I moved out here to near Washington, D.C., where I am now, um, in October of 2021. And I've been at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center um, ever since then. And my job here is to support JWST Solar System Science in uh, the Guaranteed Time Observation Program, which is a program um, uh, run by Heidi Camel. Um, let's start with the one that you all knew the best. Um, so it's the world's most famous space telescope still. Hopefully JWST one day will take over. I'm quite impressed considering JWST has only been in that area about uh, in, in space for uh, about a year, just over a year, but it's um, the second most uh, exciting one. So Hubble launched in 1990, so it's been around a while. Uh, it's, it was launched into a low Earth orbit where it's still going strong now. Um, and it's actually almost exactly the same age as me. Um, and in that time, it's uh, done over 1.5 million observations and produced beautiful images and done groundbreaking solar system science. Um, so it's been looking at all the outer planets um, for decades now. Um, and uh, here you can see some uh, example uh, Hubble images uh, of, of Uranus and uh, it's tracked multiple seasons at the planet. Um, and Uranus rotates uh, on its side, which is unlike any other planet in the solar system. Um, so this left image, uh, these left images here show how strange that change in season looks um, for a planet that's on its side. Um, and that's in just uh, four years, considering that the planet has an 84 year um, trip around the sun. Uh, so these two middle images uh, were taken 20 years apart um, and at different wavelengths, but you can really see the detail with which um, Hubble can see um, this very, very distant planet. And now um, we've only just started with JWST, but you all seem to know um, a lot about it, which is exciting. And uh, I don't even have any pictures of Uranus to show you yet, um, but they'll be coming very soon. Um, so watch out for that. And uh, JWST has a 6.5 meter primary mirror made of 18 separate movable segments. It's tennis court size, five layer sun shield to protect it from any heat from the sun. Um, and the animation here shows the huge size of both of these observations. Um, and a person there is for scale, seeing the um, amazing scale that we have here. And uh, it was launched, uh, the JWST, uh, Christmas 2021, so not long ago, and then it had six months of travel deployment and commissioning. 
Um, so it traveled to its home at the L2 Lagrangian point, 1.5 million kilometers away. Um, and uh, it deployed by unfolding on its way and commissioning was getting the telescope ready for science. Uh, so it's only really been doing science observations for less than a year. And it's the premier observatory of the next decade. It's gonna serve thousands of astronomers worldwide. It already has done so many observations already, uh, including in the solar system. And building it already was an international collaboration between NASA here in the US, uh, the European Space Agency, including the UK, and uh, the Canadian Space Agency. So uh, Spitzer, Spitzer Space Telescope, a lot of you haven't heard of um, Spitzer Space Telescope, um, which is um, sad, but also um, exciting that I get to tell you about it. Um, Spitzer was launched in the same generation of telescopes as Hubble. Um, it was launched in 2003, and it was decommissioned actually only very recently in uh, January 2020. Uh, it was in an Earth trailing orbit, um, so following us around the sun, and it's uh, pretty small compared to um, these other two uh, telescopes. Um, its mirror is, on, is less than a meter across. Um, and if we now compare directly these three telescopes, um, one of the big differences is their mirror size, but also their wavelength range. Um, so for telescopes, bigger always means better. So larger mirror means more collecting area. We can look at dimmer, smaller, colder, more distant objects. And uh, JWST's mirror is an, uh, an area more than five times greater than Hubble's and 45 times greater than Spitzer's. And one of my favorite facts is that uh, the Spitzer mirror is the same size as the mirror, uh, the secondary mirror on the JWST. So um, that's the mirror that is on the end of those booms um, that reflects the light back into the instruments. Um, so that's the same size as the Spitzer mirror. Uh, and another big difference is their wavelength range. Uh, Hubble works in shorter wavelengths, uh, mostly in the visible, but it works from the UV through the visible into the near infrared. And JWST and Spitzer work exclusively in infrared wavelengths. Um, so they're looking at heat instead of the light that we see with our eyes. Uh, and that's useful for planetary science because we can look through the clouds and hazes and see the thermal and chemical structure of atmospheres. And my PhD uh, research used the Spitzer mid-infrared spectrograph um, or the uh, IRS or the infrared spectrograph. So if bigger means better for telescopes, then why not just use these huge telescopes that we have readily accessible on the ground? Uh, why even bother going to space in the first place? Well, um, these facilities on the ground are more accessible, um, so we do use them a lot, um, but uh, we have problems with the atmosphere. So this gray image here of Uranus is in the near infrared from the Keck telescope. That is a 10 meter diameter mirror telescope um, uh, based in Hawaii. And uh, the blurrier orange image that's in the mid-infrared from the VLT, or the Very Large Telescope, that's based in Paranal, Chile. Um, that's an 8.2 meter diameter telescope, so both huge telescopes. Um, and we do get these incredibly good images, but um, not as good as um, the images that we can get from space, um, because we only get them at very um, specific wavelength bands where we have windows in the, uh, um, these optical windows in the atmosphere, because um, the Earth's atmosphere absorbs all the interesting things that we want to look at. Um, it really gets in the way and absorbs that signal, uh, especially at mid-infrared wavelengths. So why is mid-infrared useful in particular for these planets? Uh, so here's uh, some example images of Uranus from visible through to microwave. And uh, these different wavelengths are sensitive to different depths in the atmosphere. So on the right, this shows uh, a vertical structure of Uranus's atmosphere. And uh, we're showing the stratosphere and the troposphere separated by uh, the tropopause. So everything above the tropopause is the stratosphere and everything below it is the uh, troposphere. And uh, we see where each of these wavelength bands sense. So visible in the purple senses the cloud tops. And we see uh, in the image um, the typical blue color of the planet that's caused by these high levels of methane in the atmosphere. And then uh, in near infrared, so in the blue, um, it senses the cloud tops, but then also these tropospheric hazes, we can see a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Then uh, in the microwave, it sounds deeper. Um, so that's in the green, it sounds deeper into the troposphere. Um, but then in the mid infrared, we can see uh, both the stratosphere and the upper troposphere. 
So these depths are what we call the middle atmosphere. Um, and uh, these images here are two uh, of Uranus in different bands in the mid infrared uh, from the VLT. And we see different structure of the uh, troposphere compared to the stratosphere all in mid infrared. Uh, and the stratosphere is extremely exciting um, to be able to look at because it contains the complex hydrocarbon hazes that dominate stratospheric processes. So um, when methane is elevated into the stratosphere by um, convection um, and storms, etc., it's broken down by um, the sun. It's broken down by photolysis or photodissociation from the sun. And, uh, and when that happens, it then reforms into complex hydrocarbon chains like acetylene and ethane um, and others. And observing these chemicals tells us a lot about the chemistry, um, about the temperature, about the dynamics dynamics of, of the atmosphere. So um, I mentioned about Spitzer. Um, Spitzer was used to observe Uranus in 2007 um, because the telescope's so small um, and Uranus is so far away. Uh, we have a small problem. We can't get any pictures. Um, so we have to treat the planet like we would a star, uh, a point source. Um, so we only get uh, spectra like this example here. So from one dot of light, we spread it apart and we get lines like this. Um, so the top and the bottom panel here show exactly the same thing, just in different units. Uh, and so the bumps and the troughs in the lines uh, show us what the atmosphere is made of, what temperature it is, and also with modeling, it can tell us how it changes at different depths. And uh, we can see the main features, methane at eight microns, and those uh, complex hydrocarbons we were talking about, like acetylene at 13 microns and ethane at 12. And uh, the overall shape of, of the spectrum is governed by temperature and also the, the collisions uh, are, are between hydrogen and helium and hydrogen, hydrogen. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you an example of how we use this data to investigate the temperature and the chemistry of the planet. Um, and these spectra are global averages made up of multiple longitude measurements averaged together. So as Uranus spins, like in the animation here, we're looking at uh, an average of all of those different faces of the planet. So for my PhD, we split apart these different faces to look to see if anything is changing between them. And we call this longitudinal variability. And that's not as easy as it sounds for Uranus because uh, it's tilted on its side and has these very extreme seasons because of it. Um, the animation here shows what Uranus looks like during a Uranian year. So that 84 year um, Earth year period uh, as it travels around the sun. Um, so that's what it looks like from Earth. Um, so when uh, Voyager looked at Uranus, its south pole was facing directly um, at us um, and, and facing the sun. And we couldn't view uh, the northern hemisphere at all during that time. Um, and we can only uh, do this kind of longitude study during and around the equinox when we can actually uh, view both northern and southern hemispheres um, together. Uh, and that's every 42 years at this equinox period. And the last equinox was in 2007 when the uh, Spitzer data was taken. Um, so uh, do we see a difference between the longitudes when, when we split them apart? The, the answer is yes, we do. We see a consistent variation, uh, which isn't what we were expecting because it's the opposite of what we saw at uh, Neptune. So the right plots here show the difference in radiances for the entire wavelength range of data. So um, the important thing to notice is that the longitude three that's in green is consistently dimmer than longitude four, which is in purple, which is consistently brighter. Um, and that's not what we were expecting. So to look closer, um, we look at each chemical species in the spectrum. So this is shown by the bands in uh, different places shown in the plot. Um, and each species here contributes to a different height in the atmosphere. Um, so this plot shows the contribution for each pressure level um, for each wavelength. And as an example, uh, we have methane here. Methane uh, contributes to higher up uh, in the stratosphere, whereas these two um, in, in green and yellow, um, they are hydrogen helium and CH3D, which is a different type of methane. They contribute to deeper down in the troposphere, so below that tropopause level. So what we can do with this information is we can plot the variation of each species as Uranus rotates. Um, so we see that the green and the yellow species that are in the troposphere, they don't vary 
between uh, uh, different longitudes at 360 degree spin, nothing changes. Whereas um, the methane, the stratospheric component, that does vary um, a lot, um, up to 15%. And we see that same variation in all of the stratospheric hydrocarbons at varying levels. So we know we have a longitudinal variation in the stratosphere, uh, but we don't know whether it's a variation in temperature or gas abundance or what physical process or feature is causing it. Um, so there are different ways to find clues. One way to find a clue is to get some spatial resolution to see what's going on. Um, and we looked at ground-based telescope images like this one from the Keck telescope. And we saw some clues that it could be linked to storm activity. Um, but uh, we can also use modeling. And we use a software called Nemesis to do something called optimal estimation retrievals of the data, um, something that they also do using uh, remote sensing at Earth as well. Um, this left plot here shows that uh, data um, compared to the model. And uh, then what we do is we model each longitude separately and we try to find which parameters need to change to cause the changes that we see in the spectrum. And we found it's realistic that it could be a change in temperature only. Um, and so this right plot here shows the changes in temperature needed for the variation that we see. So we only need around three degrees um, temperature difference in the stratosphere uh, to cause the changes that we see in the spectrum, which is a very realistic change in temperature for uh, an ice giant. Um, but uh, these are just guesses as to what is going on on the planet, and we are patiently waiting to see if JWST can give us any more clues. Um, so how is JWST better? Um, we are currently, uh, frequently, we have to choose between uh, information or, uh, or images. Um, so we have to choose between finding out what something's made of and what it looks like. Um, so either uh, information like Spitzer can give us with its spectra or images from large ground-based telescopes that are only in certain wavelengths. Um, whereas JWST um, can give us both. Um, it uses something called an IFU or an integrated field unit. Um, basically, that means that every pixel in a picture that it takes has um, a spectrum that we can look at, um, like the ones that Spitzer give us. And uh, this forms something called an image cube because it has three dimensions of information. And here's an example of a model of what the MIRI IFU is going to see. So the mid-infrared IFU on JWST is going to see when it looks at Uranus. Um, and each pixel in this image is going to have an associated spectrum like the snippet shown above. And this spectrum is even better than the Spitzer spectrum. And we have hundreds of them, uh, one for each pixel. And we can use this to look at the spectrum uh, uh, or the specific feature, like a storm. Um, so pick out the pixel that has the storm in it and see if this is the cause of the global changes that we see with Spitzer. And I, I can't show you any real JWST Uranus data yet because um, it was only taken uh, in January. Um, uh, but uh, what I can tell you is that it looks remarkably like the model. So I'm PI of some uh, Hubble time that's looking at both the ice giants to help JWST. Um, so uh, we're using Hubble and JWST um, together to, to get even better science. And we've used the WFC3 UVIS instrument to collect visible and near infrared images of Uranus in January at the same time as JWST. And uh, JWST can't look invisible, so it expands our ability to see certain things, especially um, these dark spots. Dark spots are, um, very unique to ice giants, um, the, the famous one, the great dark spot of Neptune. Uh, we also see them at Uranus, like this example image here from Hubble. And uh, they're associated with storm activity, we think, um, and they're only visible at blue wavelengths. So we definitely need visible to see them. We need Hubble. Uh, and also with those uh, IFU or image cubes, um, we get a lot of information, but we sacrifice a little bit of spatial detail. Um, so we can get better detail from Hubble in the near infrared to identify finer features like um, small storms or clouds. And um, something called the OPAL or Outer Planet Atmospheres Legacy Program has been observing these planets with Hubble since 2014 consistently. Um, so we'll also gain the ability to look at how it changes over time. So we'll gain some temporal context because of that. Uh, and there are actually multiple programs that observed um, Uranus alongside JWST as well as our program. Uh, so uh, we have additional HST observations in the UV. Uh, we have XMM Newton looking in the X-ray and uh, the huge mirror of Keck. Um, they all took images of uh, Uranus in uh, January. So um, 
the results from those observations are something to look forward to, uh, along with these other things as well. So there's more Uranus uh, will be coming in the cycle two of, of JWST observations, which start um, towards the end of this year. And uh, the next speaker, Athena, will be uh, talking more about the exciting future mission that should be heading to Uranus soon. Um, and all of this remote sensing that I've been talking about um, uh, we do with uh, the stuff that we do with the space and ground-based telescopes uh, that helps to prioritize the science that we want to do when we do uh, finally visit and it's really important for um, this future mission that, that hopefully will happen so um, yeah thank you for your time and I'm looking forward to your questions later brilliant thank you so much wow I've learned loads there and I'm amazed at like the resolution of JWST the, the information you're going to get um we're really excited to see that so I'm looking forward to that coming out soon um but yeah it looks absolutely incredible um and it's amazing to see how much we're doing with space telescopes and ground-based telescopes you know it's we don't always need space missions but actually they are very handy and I think that takes us on really well to what Athena is going to speak about um, but you know it's really interesting to see that actually before we launch that huge mission um, there's still loads that we're learning along the way so we have loads of questions coming in but um, anyone watching at the moment even on Facebook if you have questions please pop those over to us and I'll put those to Naomi and Athena at the end um, so yeah thank you very much Naomi that was, that was brilliant um, Athena, can I welcome you to turn on your camera and uh, share your presentation now? Um, let's see if we can get that up on screen. Loads more questions coming in. I'm, I'm very excited. This is a. Uh, yes, I, let I'm me know. Learning. That's <laughs> great. Yes, that's up yes. on screen. We can hear you. We can see you. So I'm going to turn my camera off now and hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, many thanks to Naomi for a wonderful presentation. She took us out of space already. So my task is going to be to take you a little bit further, all the way out to um, Uranus. Um, and I do not dispute, absolutely not, that we need the ground-based observations um, uh, to, to actually develop the space missions that we put out there. But um, I I'm also going to make an argument for in situ observations, that is, to be out there. Um, I just want to start with a little bit of history here because uh, Uranus was discovered in, uh, Mar in March uh, 1781 by the well-known astronomer William Herschel um, and more than 200 years later um, the NASA spacecraft Voyager 2 flew past Uranus in uh, January 1986 and this was our first ever close encounter with um, the ice giant planet sitting at 20 astronomical units that is 20 times further out from the sun um, than the earth um, and the only one since then that is 36 years ago and it's important to put us in this kind of context um, at that time actually um, a few years later uh, i was a phd student at paris observatory in Madonna, and that's what you see here um, at the right lower uh, panel image and I was working for my um, thesis in astrophysics and space techniques. And I was given a chance at the time to work with some of my NASA go to space flight center colleagues um, on some of the infrared um, data uh, that we had recovered from the iris spectrometer on board of Voyager. Um, and we looked at things like um, the albedo, the effective temperature and energy balance of Uranus that we published in a paper um, 1989. And since then, I've been involved, I can say, in several attempts to bring the ice giants back to the forefront of space exploration. Um, and I have been doing that and working with colleagues from Europe, uh, like Lee Fletcher and others, and uh, in particular from the UK, but also people from the US and elsewhere. Uh, but I, I have to admit that until recently, I had largely failed. Um, however, it seems that the momentum of the scientific community is now sufficient to boost the dynamics behind uh, such a mission, in, in particular for um, Uranus. So while waiting for this to happen, um, I had a chance to contribute as part of the scientific community via, um, via research that I conduct in uh, planetology, specializing in the outer solar system and exploration of the icy moons also. I've worked a lot with the Cassini-Huygens mission, which is going to be a uh, an enormous heritage for all the other missions we send out in the outer solar system, uh, but also by a number of uh, committees that I currently uh, chair or participate, like the ones that you see here on the screen, um, for ESA, for the uh, uh, Space Agency in France, and uh, for COSPAR. 
But let's discuss, um, I'd like to discuss a little bit further, um, complementing Naomi's presentation, the why and how we can uh, further um, explore Uranus. Um, so um, I will pose that we know a lot more about the inner solar system than we do about the outer solar system. And this is for obvious reasons. I mean, everybody understands that it's further away, more difficult to access and to study. Uh, with specific constraints on launch windows and trajectories and so on. So for these reasons, the giant planets have eluded into situ uh, regular or even sufficient, I would say, uh, exploration, which is a huge throwback um, in our um, study uh, of the formation and evolution of the solar system. Um, so we know today um, that the internal and outer parts of the solar system are actually connected even more so uh, than we thought before, thanks to the discovery of the effects of the migration uh, theory. But already in the outer solar system, um, there are significant differences between giant planets, um, uh, gas giant planets, uh, or Uranus, uh, the, the, sorry, the gas giant planets and the ice giants, but also uh, Uranus and Neptune, we understand today that they are different from the gas giants in chemical composition because we think they were likely formed further out from the sun with heavier elements in place. And we call Uranus, um, as you heard before, a Neptune, the ice giant. And I think this description brings to mind images of a frozen world, but the name mostly distinguishes them from the gas giants, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. I, I think their true nature is surprisingly obscure. Um, we may discover things that do not correspond with this frozen model in the future. Um, so, uh, planets like Jupiter and Saturn have been explored much more uh, recently with probes uh, and orbiters like Cassini or currently in the Jovian system we have Juno. But the two ice giants uh, that are sized between the rocky worlds and the gas giants, um, you see here their, their mass is compared to Jupiter and uh, Saturn, are the least known planets in the solar system. So Uranus and Neptune represent a distinct, in my mind, class of planets in the solar system and beyond. Uh, whereas Jupiter and Saturn are made mostly of hydrogen, the bulk compositions of Uranus and Neptune are dominated, as I said, by heavier, heavier ices like <clears throat> water, methane, hydrogen sulfide, uh, and ammonia. Uh, and they form slowly and uh, at their interior, in, interiors you have at great depth uh, a super ionic uh, water ice mantle instead of the metallic uh, hydrogen that we see in Jupiter and Saturn. And so these ice giants may be actually representative of similarly sized planets common throughout the galaxy, uh, but remain, um, uh, as Naomi was saying before, the least investigated planets in the solar system and the planets that we know the, the least about today. So, Uranus compared to Neptune on the right here, Uranus presents a compelling scientific target, providing a unique opportunity to explore um, a nice giant system with its five classical satellites, potential ocean worlds uh, with drastic surface features. And we have also dynamically full and apparently haphazard system of rings and small moons around there. And it's also subject to the planetary and magnetospheric effects of its highly tilted. You can see the brooch I have here today that I had it made a long time ago for Uranus and it's upside down. So it's really tilted um, rotational axis being almost um, in Uranus orbital uh, plane. And it's a strongly uh, multipolar intrinsic magnetic field. So, however, as Naomi mentioned, um, and as these images demonstrate, Uranus is no longer the bland planet that Voyager revealed. It is a banded world uh, with storms, waves, and extreme contrasts. Con contrast. Um, Neptune here to the right is self-luminous. Um, it has an immense internal energy and it powers storms. Um, uh, but, but in the case of Uranus, Uranus emits no more heat than it receives from the sun. So the question is, has it already been lost or is it somehow locked somewhere inside? So we have two planets where we have high contrasts in their dynamic atmospheres, extreme seasons for Uranus and dramatic meteorology on Neptune. 
And this is um, another way of showing what Naomi was talking about. Um, images to recall what we know today about Uranus's temperature structure as derived from the Spitzer observations that Naomi discussed and compared to vertical profiles of methane, ethane, and acetylene and the approximate locations of uh, the Uranus methane and uh, hydrogen uh, sulfide clouds. And as Naomi said, hydrogen probably comprises, you know, four-fifths, so we're talking about a giant planet, of the Uranian upper atmosphere, uh, with the remainder mostly helium, but also important cloud-forming molecules. We have carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur in place. I mean, Earth has one main condensable um, water, uh, which forms clouds, precipitates out, and transports uh, heat, creating weather. But Uranus has at least four condensable molecules, um, water, ammonia, hydrogen, sulfide, and methane, to form clouds in the troposphere. And at the uppermost levels, methane condenses into um, bright patchy clouds that you show in the pro previous images. And then it forms the haze that Naomi mentioned. Uh, so this is this is very complicated. It's it's a complicated place to to do spectroscopy and to find out what exactly the composition is. We have all these different cloud levels going deeper and deeper. Um, eventually, as pressure and temperatures rise at deeper levels, um, decks of water ice and ammonia ice clouds may form. But it's really hard to say how much water is present um, below the clouds because we can't study it via uh, remote sensing. Um, so, so we don't know exactly how and where uh, all these clouds are, are formed, and how they 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 uh, um, what they do in the in this kind of medium, and how to understand the ice giant atmospheres. Because unfortunately, also Voyager 2 uh, had cameras that missed wavelengths beyond orange, and there's a lot of extra cloud structure that you can't see um, without the infrared wavelengths that uh, Naomi was mentioning. So these, um, besides the remote observations that Naomi was defending, I, it is also essential to have something very close by. You need to have a spacecraft that is studying the Uranian atmosphere with spectrometers, with long exposures, so that we can get um, a monitoring uh, with high spatial resolution. And um, such a, and also we need um, a probe, a probe that can get inside the atmosphere, something like um, the Galileo probe that entered uh, Jupiter's um, atmosphere in December 1995. And that probe survived uh, crashing pressures um, to record water, methane, um, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and traces of hydrocarbons failing only inside Jupiter around 22 bar. Um, but scientists hope that if we go to Uranus with a probe, we could get down to 10 bar at least, and then possibly 20. And some people, very optimistic like myself, we hope as um, pressures as high as 50. Um, and though transmitting the signal back to the orbiter could prove challenging at those um, depths. Uh, so uh, we don't know much about the internal structure and composition of uh, Uranus and Neptune. Uranus is unli uh, unlikely to have a layered, a layered interior uh, with distinct mantle and core, given what we learned from visits to Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, but we have some fleeting um, glimpses of the Uranian um, gravitational field and magnetosphere from Voyager 2. Um, but better insights require really a dedicated orbiter because while the, the mass and radius of Uranus are known, models only sketch its structure from patchy data. Um, and so we don't know, um, and until we go there with a dedicated mission, we won't know for sure how this is working. Uh, but also um, another thing is that uh, the moons, the moons um, around uh, Uranus uh, is a very strange ensemble of moons that really deserve further closing studies. Before Voyager 2 began observing Uranus, there were five known moons, a name after, as you well know, characters from Shakespeare. You have Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon, shown here compared to Dione, which is one of um, Saturn's satellites to scale. Um, but the spacecraft discovered 11 new moons, and 27 of them are now known. Um, and these moons um, uh, were revealed by uh, the 
the flyby that showed geological activity on uh, some uh, large uh, ice rock moons, and these are potential ocean worlds. Um, Titania and Oberon may be large enough to harbor subsurface oceans, especially if their water layers uh, contain sufficient amounts of ammonia or another antifreeze. Um, a third area might have been uh, tidally heated to the point of creating a water ocean in its interior. So this makes uh, them a very um, interest um, uh, makes them very interesting in terms of astrobiology, for instance. Uh, thus, you can see here some pictures uh, quickly as examples. On aerial surface, we find smooth flat floors, perhaps indicative of flows, extension of folds, and other uh, features. And on Oberon, to the right, we have possibly the presence of organic material in what we see uh, here taken with the RTF uh, specs um, spectrometer. Um, and also coming back to the heat fluxes that I mentioned before, the strange tilt and the possibility of a collision may actually be linked uh, to another observation that sets Uranus apart from Neptune and the two gas giants, uh, because these planets radiate away the heat generated at the time they condensed and compressed matter during formation, uh, while Neptune, as I said before, emits around two and a half times more heat delivered by the Sun, Uranus is in thermal equilibrium. So Neptune seems to have lots of heat left over from the formation, while Uranus has almost none. So one consequence of this is the more placid atmosphere on Uranus that we have um, than on turbulent Neptune, as seen in the images. Uh, but we don't know why this is the case, and we're still trying to place to piece together um, whether the ice giants migrated out and one knocked Uranus over, whether they swapped places. And such early planetary evolution really requires good gravity field data to figure out what is Uranus' internal structure. Um, and so the planet's moons and ring system, they connect, they move around its lopsided axis, as you see here. The rings are not as developed as around Saturn. The Uranian rings are are very dusty and they contain a lot less ice than the rings that we see around Saturn, for instance, but they could be conceivably um, uh, remnants of a past collision. And an orbiter can study them and bring into light the resemblances or differences in composition between the rings and, and the moons. So I wanted to uh, uh, give you a little bit of information on uh, a mission to the Uranian system that could come uh, in the in the years um, start to be developed actually uh, from now on in the years to come a dedicated mission to Uranus uh, because of course the ice giants have been a top priority of the scientific community for a long time um, they were advocated by teams in Europe and elsewhere in the world especially in the US uh, it was I was part of the steering uh, group for the Origins, uh, Worlds, and Life, um, NASM, uh, that's the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Decadal Surveying, Planetary Sciences and Astrobiology for the next decade. And we achieved consensus during that exercise that the next large mission, the next flagship uh, for NASA, should be the Uranus Orbiter and Probe. So I'll give you a summary of the study here and uh, try to walk you through in more detail in the next uh, the, uh, slides. But you can see here that this is really uh, for an institute and multi-year um, exploration of all the aspects of the system. Uh, this is the, will be a first dedicated uh, study of, of, uh, of a, a place where uh, we could uh, find categories among exoplanets uh, in the future. Um, it's it's a mission that doesn't require uh, innovation in technology. It's ready to start and go from the heritage it has. Um, it should launch uh, on a very strong rocket. Uh, we um, advocate here for the Falcon Heavy Expendable. Uh, we have optimal launch windows before 2033, but uh, ways to go uh, beyond that and a strong international interest, um, as I said before. So um, a Uranus mission would enable a large spectrum of multidisciplinary and, and cross-disciplinary studies that can uh, address priority questions on the formation of the outer solar system, the structure and evolution of giant planets, uh, their moon systems, um, and even exoplanets. 
um, and astrobiology aspects. Uh, so we will get insights in processes, origins, habitability, and interconnections. Um, and some of the science goals I started already explaining to you are, are shown here with the origins, uh, when and where did Uranus form, um, did they migrate with Neptune or swap positions, did a catastrophic giant impact tilt Uranus, how did it happen, what is the internal structure, then for processes, what mechanisms are transporting heat energy um, in the planet, uh, and satellites today, how are the uh, components uh, in the Uranian system, how do they interact with each other, are there external factors uh, that are altering the, the system? How does the solar wind interact with the magnetosphere? And also conditions in uh, habitability, as did any of the Uranus moons uh, have oceans in the past or do they still have uh, today? And so for the origins, for instance, um, more than half of the Grand Track uh, migration simulations, Grand Track is <clears throat> the hypothesis that proposes that Jupiter formed um, at a distance of 3.5 um, astronomical units from the Sun and then migrated inward, reversing uh, course due to capturing uh, Saturn in an orbital resonance. But uh, these models that are really very important for us today have uh, completely changed our perception of the formation of the solar system, um, show that Uranus and Neptune swapped positions. And we should be able to better investigate um, the when and where the ice giant uh, planets formed uh, by looking at the composition, including for isotopes and noble gases. But the composition will also allow us to constrain um, the protosolar and accretion models more generally, while at the same time, um, if you get the in-situ composition and gravity measurements, uh, we will be able to um, answer uh, questions uh, more generally um, about the formation and evolution of the planet, the role of giant impacts and its obliquity, the internal structure and the internal heat. <clears throat> and processes I mentioned before, many complex and important processes in the Uranian uh, system will have to be investigated, like uh, the one shown here, what led to the current in internal structure, how and where is the Uranian dynamo generated, and how the magnetosphere interacts with the rings, um, the satellites, uh, and so on. And uh, finally, um, habitability. Habitability is an important aspect in all our exploration of the solar system uh, these days. We, we look for habitable environments all over the solar system. I put together a poll, if we can bring that up, um, about habitable conditions. There we go. So this is a great question. What do we need for life to start? Um, so I've probably made the answers to this poll quite hard um, because I think we all think we know what the answer is. <laughs> but actually, um, let's see what people make of the poll. So we'll give people a couple of moments. OK, let's close the poll there and just uh, bring up the answers if we can. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there you go, Athena. I'll hand back to you. I, if you can see the answers there, um, Mo, it was between we don't know yet and, and the top answer, which was light energy, water and organic matter. Could you reveal which was the correct answer? <laughs> right. Excellent. Um, uh, and I think people um, are correct uh, because um, we go for the conditions that at least astrophysicists use to say what are the habitable conditions that we need water, we need organic matter, and we need energy. I mean, light, I think, um, also counts for, for energy in some places, but when we are up there in the solar system, any kind of energy source, whether chemical or you know from tides and so on, will count. So these are the conditions, and you have to have that in a stable environment. Um, so we need to look at the moons of, um, uh, around Uranus for possible subsurface uh, liquid oceans um, via, uh, you know, the evidence of past, for instance, resurfacing, um, among other techniques. And we will also look for active plumes because that would be an indication of energy sources of, or subsurface uh, internal heat uh, currently in place. So a lot of things to do um, in, in terms of um, habitability. I hope this is, um, yes. And then the interconnections, important how to know the solar wind interacts with a complex um, tilted magnetosphere um, and, and, uh, and prioritize actually the ice giants. Um, uh, what are their, is their size the most common 
among the exoplanets detected in our galaxy today, among the thousands of exoplanets we have identified today, there is a whole category of exoplanets that correspond to Uranus or Neptune-sized uh, planets. And so we very much look forward with uh, also James Webb to find out, um, to discover more um, local ice giants um, and have some extrapolation from our studies in our solar system to go beyond. And of course, mission synergies. I mentioned before that um, uh, we, we will have heritage from missions like Cassini, Galileo, and we have strong international interest uh, within NASA, but also uh, abroad, and uh, the scientific community is ready to go there. You see all these reports over the years. And there is a possible collaboration between ESA and NASA that has been identified early on for a probe mission, something like perhaps Cassini-Huygens, complementing a flagship mission, an orbiter going to uh, Uranus. There are discussions currently between the two agencies on how to push forward with this mission. Um, the design is shown there. I just want to highlight a possible payload with magnetometer, um, several kinds of cameras, um, also a spectrometer, absolutely necessary, and comprehensive fields and particle suite, radio science with an ultra-stable oscillator. And the probe would, of course, have to carry atmospheric structure, mass spectrometer, um, also, uh, also the ultra-stable oscillator and orthopower hydrogen sensor. Flight time is something like 11 or even 13 years, depending on uh, the trajectory uh, chosen. And we hope to go on a very powerful um, rocket like Falcon 9 Heavy expendable. And uh, the cruise uh, would take us there uh, in about... Um, uh, you know, uh, if we flew in 2033, we'd get there about 2044 or 2045. Uh, uh, and that would be a, a wonderful time to study these ice giants. You see in this graph how many times we've gone around uh, some of the other objects in the solar system, but the ice giants are out there on the right remain uh, with just a couple of flybys. And really, this is this is a good time now to return with a Uranus mission, uh, which is technically feasible and cost effective, we think, um, and really science uh, compelling. So with that, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, give you back the floor. Oh, wow. Thank you. Goodness me, there was so much information there. And I think one thing I always like to point, point out to people, particularly if those not involved in space science is the time scales of these missions. They seem absolutely incredible that you're now working on a mission that may not arrive at its target for what are we talking about, another 20 years or so. Um, and you know, scientists see their entire careers, don't they? You know, come and go within within the lifetimes of these missions and you know things have to be handed over to a whole new set of scientists who are coming onto the scene. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, it like Naomi's coming along and she's, you know, going to be following up this work and it's amazing. But um it yeah, it's a very long way away. And of course, this is why uh we haven't been able to go very often so far, or only once. Um so I'll invite Naomi to turn her camera back on now. Um we we will try and get through some of the questions now. We've had three questions about the tilt of Uranus. Um, so, and I know you mentioned that in, in your presentation, Athena, but I wonder if any of you could kind of just expand on why we think um, Uranus has, has got that, you know, extreme tilt compared to the other planets. Yes, uh, it, it is one of the questions we're asking actually ourselves, but um, it's true that several of the models today um, indicate that there could have been, you know, like an impact in the system that has tilted um, Uranus the, the way it is today. Um, there, there are models that explain that very well, uh, but uh, for it, it to have persisted for all this time, you know, is, is, is the big question. How, how didn't it, you know, change that somehow it has stayed uh, vertical as we see it today? So it is one of the questions we're going to address uh, with, a, with a future mission. Uh, this tilt is is really, like I said before, you know, something we wonder about. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've had a question from Facebook from the people watching over there, um, which is actually really good. And I don't know the answer to this question, so it's a, it's a really interesting one. I hope one of you knows the answer. Um, why do we always illustrate uh, Uranus is blue in all the textbooks? It's blue, um, it, and they say, is it because there's lots of methane on on the planet? Naomi, any ideas? Yeah, so um, invisible, um, when we look at it with our eyes, um, it's uh, this like beautiful, like um, like light 
um, sky blue color compared to Neptune's um, like deep blue color. Um, we're still not 100% sure why the two planets have two different blues, um, but um, we do know that that blue is it's the same reason that um, the sky appears blue when you look up. Um, the the methane in the atmosphere like reflects blue light back into your eye, and and so that's why you you see um, blue. But um, even with um, when we look uh, at images that are from the infrared, um, we, we don't actually see it in blue in the infrared. Um, it usually comes down um, to us in black and white. Um, but artists usually um, make it uh, recognizable and distinctive by by coloring it into uh, a blue color so that we recognize that it's um, our famous ice giant. Thank you. That's that's a very comprehensive answer. Brilliant. I hope that that helps. Um, now we've had a quite a few questions, in fact, about super ionic water, um, and I think most of the questions relate to what is it, um, and and can one of you explain a little bit more about why it's um, important on Uranus? Um, yeah, Athena, do you want to? I, I mean, I can explain the the stuff below that, I suppose. But super ionic water. Yeah, you then I'll comment. <laughs> Me too, Naomi. It is a complicated answer, so I'll hand it off to the new generation. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what's happening? Um, uh, we we don't really know what's happening underneath. Um, like, uh, like as you get deeper and deeper into uh, Uranus and Neptune, um, and. Uh, what we think is happening, um, because we know that um, there's there's probably a lot of water content. Um, this uh, what happens when you like squeeze water um, in the deep pressures that you get at, at these planets. Um, you you end up with very strange things that um, uh, that you wouldn't expect. You you don't get naturally on Earth. Um, so uh, scientists, um, uh, people in labs, have uh, squeezed uh, water in um, like laboratory conditions and see what happens and um, what they found was when you when you squeeze it you um, end up with this um, super ionic water which is um, uh, uh, super um, this basically squeezed and um, uh, it conducts it, it creates like crystal it's a crystalline yeah. phase um, applies to all kind of ices. You can do this with all kind of ices, as Naomi's saying. It, it's high pressure, high temperature phases, and and then you you squeeze it, <laughs> and uh, oxygen ions really would occupy a, a crystalline kind of phase. You know, you they they where you know whereas the protons diffuse in liquid mine. Um, like manner this time you have this crystal forming it, it's a it's a complicated answer quick kudos to it's Naomi. Very strange it's like hot and black ice that um so when uh so the so oxygen hi, hydrogen and oxygen um the oxygen like um forms together into like a lattice and then the um the hydrogen atoms like flow between them so it's not a solid or a liquid. It's like this other thing, and um, yeah, it, it conducts electricity very well. Um, so it might be why we have strange, uh, like very high um, magnetic fields in in the um, uh, in both ice giants. Um, but it, again, we we just don't know whether this is actually something that is down there or not. And an orbiter wow. will be able to tell us more. That's incredible. Um, thank you. That has definitely answered the question, but it, it was complicated. But I think um, hopefully that because we had questions relating to the magnetic field in relation to the superionic water as well. So that's really handy. We are really limited on time, but I am deciding to run a few minutes over because we've got a, a few more questions I'd really like to ask. Um, so I'm just going to ask you very quickly about can we look at organic molecules in the atmosphere? Um, and also someone's asked, can we see elements such as mercury? Um, specifically and that's a question from Christian. Yeah we have detected I mean um, we have detected acetylene and I think in this, uh, thing as, recall, as I recall you know in, um, in, uh, in Voyager uh, data already at the time so there is some organic uh, there are some organic molecules there uh, we don't know how um, how evolved the degree of complexity of this organic chemistry is this is something that you know, as, as we were both saying, we'll take more in situ observations at deeper length, uh, deeper uh, in the atmosphere to find out what is 
uh, line between the cloud layers, but we do have some organic molecules there, except that we are not looking for organic chemistry in Uranus because that is not going to be a habitable environment. <laughs> uh, there's no surface uh, to, to, to work on. Um, so we're going to look for these things um, at, uh, with the, the, the moons that I was describing before. So one of the slides I showed had this dark material that is something that could be organic material in, on some of the icy moons. So this is something that we're going to investigate more uh, with James W. Uh, or other uh, telescopes. Yeah, and that's often the case with a lot of these planets. We, their moons are actually sometimes, you know, a, a more habitable environment, uh, more similar to Earth. So brilliant. Um, I think we're going to have to call it a day. I'm really sorry for all the questions that we didn't get through, but I hopefully combined some questions so that we actually answered more than, than it seemed. Um, but yeah, thank you. If you have any further questions specifically for our speakers, then please do get in touch with them. The emails are on the screen. Um, we have had a little comment from uh, Neil, uh, who suggests that you visit the, if you're in the UK at any point and you go to the beautiful city of Bath, um, you can visit the Herschel House, um, where you can actually see where the an original lenses and mirrors were made that um, he discovered Uranus with. So that sounds great. I've never done that. So thank you for that recommendation. Um, have, have either of you been there? <laughs> no, I haven't been there, but um, I, I only just got told about it recently. To be honest, I'm a terrible Uranus scientist. I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> so um, it's only last week that I found out about it. <laughs> Well, there we go. There we go. Your next holiday can be to Bath. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, thank you so much to both our wonderful guests today. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Athena. They were thank amazing you. presentations. I, can well, I I've just loads. say one thing? I just wanted to say hello to my grandfather. He's a fellow of the society and he's oh. watching today. Um, he's in his 90s. So hi. Hi, granddad. Oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. That's I'm, I'm hope that he's enjoyed. I'm sure he has found this thrilling and love seeing you on here well thank you and, and hello um well yeah thank you again it's it's been fantastic and thanks to the audience you've been really engaged we've had lots of brilliant questions Asking how big the universe is seems like a silly question. I mean, like, it's big, really big. How big, you might ask? Oh, I don't know. There's probably a your mama joke in there somewhere. But suffice it to say that it's ginormous. But ginormous isn't really a scientific term, although it should be. So seriously now, how big is the universe? Well, the first thing you need to realize is that many people misunderstand exactly what that question is asking. We first need to distinguish between the entire universe and the universe visible from Earth. Those are different things. So how much of the universe can we see from our vantage point here on Earth? Well, light has a finite speed, specifically about 300,000 kilometers per second, or about 186,000 miles per second, which means that when you see an astronomical object, you're seeing it like it was in the past. For instance, it takes light from the sun eight minutes to get to the Earth. You probably knew that. But that has bigger implications. For instance, that means that there is a sphere around the Earth with the radius of the Earth-Sun distance where light takes eight minutes to travel to us. And that sphere idea is true in general. There is a sphere around the Earth with a radius of a light year. If we could somehow send lots of super bright lights a light year away to surround the Earth and briefly blink them, what would happen is that the light pulse would take a year to get to the Earth and they'd arrive at the same time. When we saw them, we'd be seeing a blink that was a year old from objects located a light year away. We can take this idea to the extreme and ask, what is the oldest thing in the universe? And that is, by definition, the moment the universe began. That happened 13.8 billion years ago. 
If the universe wasn't expanding, the farthest thing we would see would be a sphere centered on the Earth with a radius of 13.8 billion light years. This is what we call the visible universe. Inside that sphere, light has had time to get to us. Outside the sphere, it hasn't. We can't see anything outside that sphere. Now I should caution you and point out that the numbers quoted for the visible universe are true only if the universe isn't expanding. Of course, it is expanding, so the situation is a little more complicated. I made a video about how that changes things, and you might even want to take a look at it. But the bottom line is that there is a sphere centered on the Earth that is the extent of the visible universe. Is that how big the entire universe is? The answer to that question is almost certainly no. The universe is bigger than we can currently see right now. And you kind of already knew that. For instance, as we look out and see the light from the beginning of the universe today, we can see out to some distance. If we look again tomorrow, we will be able to see out to that distance plus an additional light day. That's because light traveling over the course of those 24 hours will be just getting here tomorrow. And inexorably, day after day, we'll be able to see a larger and larger sphere of the universe. There are locations that we cannot see today because the light simply hasn't had time to get to us that we'll be able to see tomorrow. Again, this ignores the complications due to the expansions of the universe. We'll get to that in a minute. So if the entire universe is larger than the portion we can see, how big is it? Well, to answer that question, we need to back up and be a bit more careful. Let's start with talking about the oldest and most distant thing we can see. As it happens, we can't see the moment the universe began. That's because the early universe was so hot that light couldn't pass through it. You can sort of think of it like a fog. However, there was a moment about 380,000 years after the Big Bang when the universe cooled enough to become clear. The temperature at which that happened is about 3,000 degrees centigrade, or about 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Everywhere in the universe, the temperature was identical. And at 3,000 degrees, it was glowing hot. So you'd think that when we looked out with our telescopes, we'd see a glow about like what looks like when you see inside a steel mill. But this is where the expansion of space comes in. Since that moment, the universe has been expanding and cooling and even stretching space. The upshot of that is that what once would have been viewed by the human eye as white is now no longer visible and can be only seen by radio antenna capable of detecting microwaves. For that reason, this oldest thing that we can actually see is called the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. And the temperature of the universe in the current day is now 2.7 Kelvin, or minus 270 degrees centigrade, or minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Pick your favorite units. So that's the first big thing. This microwave radiation that measures that the current temperature of the universe as 2.7 Kelvin is a fossil remnant of light emitted when the universe was about 3,000 degrees. This temperature is almost the same everywhere, but we've learned that there are very small variations in the universe's temperature. These variations really are incredibly tiny. The hottest and coldest spots are only a hundredth of a percent different from the average. Our current best measurements of these variations comes from a telescope in space called Planck. Astronomers using the Planck Observatory have measured the entire sky, and their map of these temperature variations is what we see here. The blue spots are colder than average, and the red spots are hotter. So those temperature differences are pretty and all, but what do they have to do with the size of the universe? It turns out that these variations were caused by sound waves in the hot universe just before it became transparent. And because we know the temperature the universe was at the time, and we've measured the total amount of matter we can see in the universe, we can calculate the wavelength of those sound waves. It's a complicated calculation, but it's a straightforward one. 
And I want to emphasize that there is no guesswork on this. We have heated matter to these temperatures, and we've measured the matter we see in the visible universe. We know a great deal about the wavelength of sounds that were present. Sound in the early universe is pretty much the same as sound you used to hear me. Sound is transmitted through variations in the density of air, and you can hear a variety of frequencies. In the early universe, the regions of higher and lower density due to the sound waves result in hotter and colder spots in the cosmic microwave background. And given that we know the wavelength of the loudest sound in the universe before it became transparent, we can calculate the angular size of the most common sizes of hot and cold spots in the microwave background. Further, we can calculate what size is most likely, and it should be one degree as viewed from Earth. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We have a firm prediction of the size of the hot and cold spots. This brings us closer to our question, which I remind you is the size of the universe. Now that prediction of one degree depends on the shape of the universe. Remember that Einstein's theory of relativity says that space and time can bend and morph. Space could be one of a variety of different shapes. It's hard to imagine this in the three dimensions that we know space really is, so we have to substitute a two-dimensional analogy. Bear with me. A flat two-dimensional space is like the surface of a table. Flat means flat. But a two-dimensional space could be like the surface of a globe, where, if you kept on walking, you could, in principle, end up back where you started. This is called a closed space. Another possibility is space could be shaped like a saddle. This is an example of what is called an open space. So those are the three basic possibilities of the shape of space. How does that fit into our question? It comes down to the fact that light travels in a straight line in space. But if space is curved, then we can get fooled. Let's use the hot and cold spots in the microwave background to see what I mean. If space is flat and a distant spot in the microwave background is one degree wide, then we will measure the size as one degree. This is the simple mathematics of triangles that you learned in geometry class, where straight lines travel in, well, straight lines. But that behavior doesn't have to apply. Let's see why. For instance, if two ants were in flat space and they were separated by a certain distance and started walking parallel to one another in a straight line in that flat space, they will always stay the same distance apart. If you do the same thing on a closed or spherical space, the two ants will eventually run into one another because straight lines in curved space are curved. This is like lines of longitude on a globe where they are parallel at the equator but intersect at the pole. And the opposite is true in an open space like the saddle space. There, the two ants, initially a fixed distant apart from one another and walking in straight lines, will eventually diverge and get farther apart. That's just curved space for you. So this has consequences when measuring the apparent size of these distant spots in the microwave background. If space is flat, the line that crosses the spot you're looking at and the two lines that go from the edges of the spot to your telescope form a common triangle. But in an open or closed curved space, the triangles are distorted. Let me be more specific because this is super important. In a closed or spherical space, what one would expect to be a straight line is curved in a specific way. The crucial effect is that the angle of the triangle near your eye is bigger than if space wasn't curved. The opposite is true for an open or hyperbolic space. Here, the curvature is in the opposite direction. We see that the angle of the triangle near your eye is smaller than if space isn't curved. Now, the telescope can't see the whole path traveled by the light. All it sees is the angle of the light coming into your eye or the telescope 
with the closed or spherical space being bigger than expected and the angle seen in the open or saddle shaped space being smaller. And if we apply this to the spots in the microwave background, this means that a spot that is one degree wide in flat space will be different in a curved space. So this is a perfect way to test whether space is flat or curved. In a flat space, the dominant size of the spots should be one degree. If space is curved and closed, the spots should look bigger. If space is curved and open, the spots should look smaller. So what did Planck and other experiments find? A drum roll please, maestro. The measurements found that the size of the spots is one degree. From that, we conclude that space is flat. Or can we? Well, yeah, sort of. But that's an incautious statement. Physics is an experimental science. When we say that the Earth is flat, what we mean is that the measurement is consistent with being flat. But that also means that the measurement is consistent with a tiny bit of curvature. For example, if we're at the beach on the ocean and look at the horizon, it surely looks flat. But in spite of the claims of some people, the Earth is most certainly not flat. It's a sphere. So you have to keep this in mind. What appears to be flat can, indeed, be curved. And when we measure the Earth, we can only say that it appears to be flat. And that's true of space as well. Space appears to be flat. If, and I repeat, if, space is flat, then the universe is infinite in extent. Our visible universe is just a small bubble in an infinite sea. Similarly, if space is shaped like a saddle, what scientists call a hyperbolic or open space, space is also infinite. But what if space is closed and shaped like a sphere, but so big that it looks flat, like the Earth can look flat? Well, in that case, space is not infinite, it has a finite size. So now we're getting somewhere. If the universe is closed, how big is it? Well, if you do a careful analysis, using the maximum possible curvature allowed by the best measurements, you find that the universe can be no smaller than 250 times bigger than the visible universe. So that's your answer. I mean, we've always kind of thought that the universe is big, but now we can hang a number on that. The visible universe, meaning the part of the universe that we can see using our instruments, is a sphere centered on the Earth and taking into account the effects of expansion with a diameter of 92 billion light years. However, the entire universe, including the parts that we can't see, is at least 250 times wider than that. And the universe could indeed be infinite in size. We've come a long way from simple speculation about the universe. Seemingly intractable questions are now getting answers, and that is your fascinating fact for the day. Okay, so that was a very cool topic. The thought that we can actually constrain such things as the size of the universe, including the bits that we can't see, is just mind-blowing. You should realize that there's even more to the conversation because this video didn't include simply versus multiply connected topologies. But you know, I had to leave something for future videos. If you like what you saw, be sure to like, comment, and share. And please subscribe to the channel, because the fact that you're watching this means that you're probably my kind of people. The kind of people who realize that physics is everything. Isn't everything silent in space, as Alien told us years ago? In space, no one can hear you scream. How can we talk about the sound of the Big Bang if there's nothing there for the Big Bang to make a sound in?
in the very early days of the universe, what you have is instead of having a uniform, a perfectly uniform distribution, quantum mechanics tells us we can't have that perfect uniform distribution. Therefore, you have fluctuations. And those tiny, tiny fluctuations, it's like a lumpiness of the soup. For there to even be sound, what you need are pressure variations. And those pre how are those pressure variations set up? Right at the start, what you have is this soup, this plasma, electrons, quarks. We haven't even got atoms. About 400,000, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, what happens is that everything cools down sufficiently so that atoms can start forming. Before that, the issue is actually you can't see through the universe because you've got this dense fog, this plasma. Tiny, tiny quantum fluctuations right at the start get blown up very, very rapidly. And those tiny fluctuations, what they do is they imprint pressure variations across the early universe. And when we look and see the cosmic microwave background, it's telling us about those pressure fluctuations. And pressure fluctuations tell us about sound. So you could say that actually everything that there is, the entire universe, the matter around us, arises due to sound, arises due to pressure fluctuations. And what happens in the Big Bang, at least in the early stages, is that that moment, that instant, is you don't have those pressure variations. Everything's moving out radially at the same rate. Actually, it was silent, which seems really, why would we call it the Big Bang if it's silent? Why would it be silent? Well, the important thing is to really have sound. Well, what is sound? Sound is a, a variation in pressure. Those fluctuations, those pressure variations, kicked in rather later on, a little bit further down the line from the Big Bang. So the Big Bang itself, it's probably best not to call it the Big Bang, it's probably best to call it something like a big light rather than a Big Bang. The density of the universe in terms of the matter in the universe was a million times greater, a million times greater than it is now. So the best way to think about the universe at that point in time is that it's all atmosphere. It's all just, it's, it's all air, effectively. It's all atmosphere. We know today that sound can't travel through space. Why can't sound tr travel through space? Simply because the density of the atoms isn't high enough to allow those sound waves to propagate. But right at the, those early stages, the density was beyond high enough for um, sound waves to travel across the universe. So it's much the same as you have standing waves and then you have harmonics on a guitar string. That's the way you've got to think about it. Uh, in terms of certain patches of space will have a higher density, certain other patches of space will have a lower density. So it's clumped together here and then falls away and then you have regions where there's a lower density and then you can think of having one harmonic, having higher harmonics in terms of how that matter is distributed. I don't see how this has anything to do with sound. But what is sound? So again, if we think about a guitar string, when you pluck that guitar string, you get a standing wave set up on that. What's happening is that you're getting, that string is moving back and forth. It's moving air molecules back and forth and they're hitting your, your ears. What's happening there? It's a hang pressure. On, hang on, hang on. There you go. You've started something propagating. It's not the guitar string that is sound. It's the propagation of the air being pushed by the guitar string. It is, yes. But if what we can do is we can interpret that that pattern that we see, we can interpret those harmonics in terms of, well, what is, what is happening is that the density is being pushed around. The, the density, the, the, the matter is being pushed around and you're getting variations in density. If you're getting variations in density, that means you're getting variations in pressure. That is sound. That is sound. So there is stuff moving. There is stuff, there is stuff moving, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but again, the best way, so why do we call it a standing wave on a guitar string? Because it's, it's a, a wave that although the string is moving up and down, where is the maximum? It's always located at the right point. If we talk about the first harmonic, it's right at the center of the string. The human ear wouldn't right. hear it. Like, what kind of listening device? So the, the problem is, is that we're talking about frequencies. So if we pluck a guitar string, I don't know, we're talking about frequencies of tens of hertz to hundreds of hertz. We're talking about periods of a few seconds, a few tenths of seconds, a few you know, hundredths of a second. When it comes to the Big Bang, we're talking about 10 to the minus 12 hertz or 10 to the minus 13 hertz. Or a better way of thinking about that is 50 octaves lower than when you pluck a guitar string. So, you know, you listen to a guitar string, you know that that's oscillating back and forth pretty rapidly. If it were the Big Bang, and we were thinking about the oscillations for the Big Bang, then that string is moving up and down. It's taking 20,000 to 200,000 years to do one oscillation. That's what we're talking about. So that's not just heavy. That's not just subsonic. That's sub, 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 sub sonic. That's, that's completely outside the realm of any type of human perception. Phil, I always think of the Big Bang as a time of incredible energy and velocity and violence. 
And yet you're talking to me about things that are moving at these sub-glacial speeds. Absolutely. It's, it's bizarre, isn't it? It's the language. It's another example of where we use language in physics and we borrow everyday terms which don't quite capture it. Does it have a note? Is it like a B-flat? Oh, that's so you can, in principle, work out where that note is. But the problem is that the, when you look at the spectrum, instead of having very nice peaks, frequency peaks, as you have with a, a guitar string, where you can say, you know, it's B flat or whatever. The problem is with the, with the Big Bang, when you look at the spectrum of the Big Bang, actually those peaks are very broad, which means that the, the note isn't, isn't a well-defined musical note, it's much more, uh, much broader and much less distinct, much more indistinct. Actually, I'm borrowing an awful lot of this from a guy called Mark Whittle at the University of Virginia. He's got a wonderful, wonderful website where he describes the, what he calls Big Bang Acoustics. Others have, have looked at this as well. And if you go to his website, then you can actually find um, WAV files, um, sounds, where he's taken this spectrum, transposed it to um, up to 50 octaves to where we could, where it's within the range of human hearing and you can listen to um, wide range of different um, aspects of the sounds of the Big Bang. Would dogs hear the Big Bang? Uh, dogs wouldn't hear the Big Bang, not unless they lived to be 200,000 years old. <laughs> you look at the cosmic microwave background, that's telling you about temperature variations, but those temperature variations, as we said, also tell you about density variations. And those density variations, in turn, will tell you about pressure variations. And once you've got pressure variations, then you can work out how many decibels the Big Bang was. What we have is something called a bell. What a bell is, is a measure of the relative loudness, let's put it that way, I'm being a bit loose with words, relative loudness of, of two signals. And the way that's defined is a bell is log, to the base 10, so it's a logarithmic measure, and the reason we do that is because our ears work logarithmically. And what you have is, let's say, two signals, P2 and P1. And this is the power signal 2, and this is the power signal 1. What we need is a reference, and let's use slightly unusual subscripts here. So let's have a loud signal, which we're going to donate with that subscript. And let's have a quiet signal, and we're going to donate that with that subscript. Now this quiet signal is our reference signal. That's taken to generally to be the limit of human hearing. Now we can quibble about what that is and there's a lot of quibbling about that, but that's defined in terms of a certain pressure which represents the limit of human hearing. That's a bell. However, what you find is it's better to work in decibels just in terms of the magnitude of the numbers involved. So decibel we define slightly differently like this, but it's exactly the same idea. That's in terms of the power of the signal. This is a subtle point and a technical point, but I'm going to put it in there because otherwise I know the whole comments section will erupt. So what we'll do now is going to convert this from a power to a pressure. And those are related, one is the square of the other, so that gives us a factor of two when it comes to the logs. And what we end up for our final formula is something that looks like this. dB is 20 log, where this is our loud signal and this is our quiet signal. If I can fit it all on the page. So normally, in air, what we'd do is we'd look at the limit of human hearing in air and think about what the pressure is associated with that. And then we think about what the pressure is associated with how I'm speaking here. Ratio the two, get the log, multiply by 20, that gives you decibels. To give you an idea of what sort of high end of decibels might be, if you're standing about, I don't know, 20 or 30 meters from a jet engine, record the sound coming from the engine, I can convert that to a pressure scale. Then if I take that pressure reading from the, um, the jet engine, compare it to the pressure associated with the absolute limit of human hearing, get that as a logarithm to the base 10, multiply by 20, that gives me about 140 decibels. That's 140 decibels is, as I say, quite noisy and getting to the limit of human hearing. Turns out that the loudest rock band, loudest heavy metal band on the planet, it's a band called Manowar, which some of you might be familiar with. If you're not familiar with Manowar, go look them up. Hours of endless fun. You know, Brady, I can see you nodding your head, you know I had to get a heavy metal reference in somewhere. They lay a claim at 139 dB to be the loudest band on the planet. They couldn't quite beat a jet engine. They couldn't quite beat a jet engine, but that's pretty good. But actually, if you stand just a little bit back from the jet engine, it falls off as the inverse square. So, yeah. so <laughs> depending on where you are with the jet engine, Manowar could be louder. <laughs> 
So, Man of War 139 dB, let's round that up, as all good physicists do, and call that 140 dB, but about the same uh, level in terms of dB as a jet engine. Now, you might think, well, this is the Big Bang, the Big Bang's just going to be billions of dB. Actually, you look at those pressure fluctuations, you do exactly what we're doing here. Of course, your reference level can't be within the soup right at the start of the universe. It can't be the limit of human hearing. But what you can do is you can get the average pressure um, from, the, from the pattern, from the cosmic microwave background, and then look at the fluctuations about that. If you look at the fluctuations in pressure, well, actually, all you want to do is you have a reference level, and then you're looking at the variation about that reference level. That's what you're doing when you think about the jet engine. So, obviously, we can't send a human back. And also, it's, you know, happening on a ridiculously long timescales. So we need something artificial. So we could set up a robot. We'd have to get the time machine sorted out, though, Brady. That's the first thing. And I've been working on that for quite some time now, and it doesn't seem to be going any, <laughs> anywhere fast. But let's say we get the time machine worked out. So we can send this robot back 13.8 billion years or so. And then what we need to do is we'd have to set it up with an artificial ear. And that artificial ear would have to be tolerant of fairly extreme environments. But we could set it up so its reference level would be whatever the, the, the baseline pressure is, and then we'd look at, we'd tra it would know, or the, it would be programmed to look at fluctuations about that baseline level. Not look, here. Thank you, here. We know the fluctuations. We know the level of the fluctuations. Remember, all we want is a ratio. So if we know those fluctuations are at the level of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, you know, one part in a million, one part in 10 million, one part in 100 million, whatever, that's, that's all we need to get uh, a dB value. With the Big Bang, well, it's, it's the origin of everyone. Wouldn't that just absolutely blow your head off? Wouldn't the volume just be, could you exist? You know, would it not just those sound waves just completely rupture you? Turns out it's not as loud as we think it is. So the number, when we work this through, we look at the decibels and we look at this, these variations in pressure, turns out about 120 decibels. That's all. So not only is a jet engine louder than the Big Bang, Man of War is much, much, much louder than the, than, than the Big Bang. Our robot would come out and say, it wasn't that loud. Indeed. It wasn't, as bad, it wasn't as bad as that Man of War concept. Exactly. <clears throat> the Big Bang is not, uh, not as loud as uh, a heavy metal band. Right, now we'll, we'll close now with the, uh, the Baby Come Back uh, launch. And uh, th this was launched from the Mahia... Um, uh, launch complex in New Zealand of Rocket Lab and uh, you'll, you'll naturally notice that uh, this one actually puts seven satellites into a sun synchronous orbit, orbit and I'll explain what that is in a moment and it put up four uh, NASA satellites and uh, private uh, weather and communication satellites when it went up and uh, when we look at uh, the launch, it's got this red uh, stripe around the top and uh, that signifies it's the first time they've tried to recover that uh, rocket. Um, originally this particular company tried to recover them by helicopter and uh, failed uh, miserably. Um, so they, uh, they changed back to being um, something more traditional in that let it splash down and uh, we'll pick it up by uh, ship. So this is the first, first one to uh, pick it up by uh, ship. and. Uh, We'll play that. It might potentially be a bit loud.
quite a bit of clipping on that one because it's a bit uh, a bit loud. And you notice that uh, it was just off the uh, east coast of Australia there uh, with that one. Now, that, what was unusual about that one was it uh, sent them up into a sun-synchronous orbit. And that's what this little diagram tries to explain here. You've got the uh, sun in the middle and you've got the earth in four places, uh, one each uh, season. So you've got September over on the left, you've got December down the bottom, March uh, over on the right, and June at the top. Now when you put a, um, a satellite into orbit, it will usually go in the, the red orbit that's uh, actually drawn there. And you'll notice the orientation of the red is the same point in space, uh, no matter where it is around uh, that orbit. So you, See, the red um, is, uh, is all pointing in the same direction in space. Now, what a sun-synchronous orbit is, is the green one. So they have to put it into a very special orbit. See, the green uh, orbit around the Earth here over in September is uh, sort of up, up at that sort of angle. But they have to turn it round somehow such that uh, as you go around, don't notice how the orientation of that green orbit is shifting. Now, how they do that is either one use a lot of fuel to uh, try and uh, change the orbit, and they don't do that. What they do is they take um, advantage of the fact that the Earth is in a perfect sphere, that it's got a bulge, uh, an equatorial bulge to it, and if they get the orbit just right, that bulge causes a slight difference in gravity. So every time it goes around, it gets a little bit of a nudge. And if they get, uh, get the maths uh, exactly right, um, that satellite turns around in that sun-synchronous uh, orbit. And the advantage of a sun-synchronous orbit is that uh, shadows on the ground are always in the same direction. All right, so you've always got, um, if, you're, if you're photographing something on the Earth, whether as a spy satellite or whatever, you're always seeing it under exactly the same lighting uh, conditions no matter where you are in the, uh, in the year. And with that, I'll uh, close the uh, March, uh, sorry, the uh, February meeting, and we'll uh, see you in uh, in March.